Welcome back to the Chronicles of Aguna, the Arsenal podcast brought to you by loserpool.com. As ever, I'm your host, Harry Simiou, and joining me in the studio this evening is Mr. Mike Stavrou. Mike, welcome back to the show. How are you? Harry, I'm good. I'm buzzing after the win, man. How long have we had to wait to actually beat United, man? How long has it been? How long has it been, especially at home as well? I think that we, we haven't beaten them in the previous two games. I think you're right. I think, so, you're right. I think the last one was uh, another one where Xhaka scored, wasn't it? If I'm not mistaken. Yeah. I think it was Welbeck and Xhaka. Was yeah. it Welbeck? I don't know. I might be completely off there. But anyway, let's get the housekeeping out of the way early doors because I always forget to do this stuff. Uh, so I think we'd better get it done from the start. So don't forget, if you're listening via iTunes, hit that subscribe button, leave us a review. If you're on YouTube, uh, hit subscribe, hit the like button, share it, follow us on Twitter at Chronicles underscore AFC. We've even got an Instagram account these days. Also, Chronicles AFC is really, really easy to find. Uh, just want to bring you guys' attention to the fact that on YouTube, we are just a few subscribers shy of hitting 1,000, which for an audio podcast is absolutely brilliant, and we're over the moon with that. But help us get to that 1,000. Uh, that was our aim at the start of the season, so if we could get there, we'd be thrilled. Um, of course, this show is sponsored by loserpool.com. It's a fantastic new betting site where you can sign up and win some huge cash prizes. And without the support of Chris and the team over there, uh, we wouldn't be able to produce the content that we are producing with such regularity. So massive thanks to all involved let's begin with the 2-0 victory over Manchester United a victory that moves us up into the top four just a point behind the vermin now um I was confident in the lead up to this one, Mike, as you know, uh, went on a couple of radio stations uh, in the build up to the game and, and Sky Sports News and was practically laughed at by everyone uh, for saying that Arsenal had a real chance of winning this and for saying that we were probably the favourites because of our home record. Uh, how did you feel going into this one? I understand you were quite confident too. Yeah, I was confident and I think the fact that you were ridiculed sort of by some of these outlets, you know, um, was ridiculous because, you know, people don't really understand or they don't really look too heavily into uh, a, a club's history. And you would know this season we've been fantastic against the top teams at home. Away we have struggled, yes. But uh, we beat Spurs, we beat Chelsea, we drew against um, we drew against Liverpool. Uh, so if you would have watched the games, you would have known we are good and Emery knows how to do it at home. So I was... I was fairly confident, but I don't think you could say after United came off that massive win against PSG that you thought was going to be a blowover. No one thought that, but our home form, I thought, would be enough, and it was. Yeah, absolutely. I, I don't think that Arsenal were strong favourites. What the point I was trying to get across was probably that I didn't think United were strong favourites, given that we were at home. I felt that it was a very 50-50 game. Um, in terms of the balance of it. And I didn't feel that it was respect respectful sorry, to Arsenal and to Unai Emery for people to be saying that United were going to come there and wipe the floor with us. Um, let's start off with uh, Unai Emery's starting lineup. Uh, it's, he started off with Bern Leno in goal, back three of Socrates, Koscielny, Monreal, Maitland Niles at right wing back, Kalasinac on the left, Xhaka and Ramsey, to most people's surprise, in the middle of the park there. Uh, and then it was Ozil, Aubameyang and Lacazette. Was you surprised when that team came out? I certainly was. I was really surprised. I said to everyone, I was um, I was at work at the time and I was like, oh my God, he's not gone balls to the wall here. You know, two strikers, Ozil as well and Ramsey in the centre. Because a lot of people have said that Ramsey and Xhaka can't work as a combination. Remember earlier in the season when we're trying to figure it out. And so I thought Guendouzi would play there naturally. And I actually didn't think Ozil would play at all. So I was shocked to see his name on the on the starting 11, uh, first and foremost. Maitland-Niles at wing back. Um, I was a bit nervous, to be honest. Uh, but after, apart from that, I was praising Emery because I thought, you know, at home you have to go for it, Harry. You can't sit back. And um, I'm glad, personally, that we've found a system where Aubameyang and Lacazette can play in the same team. And I think this is a kind of blueprint we need um, to take against big teams. Do you think it's the long-term answer, though, in terms of a system? Because 
I'm still not convinced. I think when I looked at the game yesterday, I, and I don't want to come across as negative because I've been accused of doing that a lot lately. But when you look at the way the game panned out, Manchester United hit the bar, they hit the post, and Bern Leno pulled off a world-class save in the first half. Do you think defensively that we're any better with a back three than when we play with a back four? Um, I think at home you can kind of get away with it. And it wasn't actually until they changed from because they started in a 4-4-2, didn't they? And they were really ineffective. I think they had Dallo as a right mid and Pogba coming in um, from the left. And they couldn't they can get the ball at all. As soon as they switched into a three, they started causing us problems. And that's when Lukaku hit the post, hit the bar. Um, are we good enough de- defensively? I think it actually gives us more solidity because when you play a four, you're going to be playing Kolasinac as a left back, who we know is not the strongest. And you're going to be playing a right back without Bellerin, probably Lichsteiner or a Maitland-Niles. So I think actually it gives us a bit more, uh, a bit more protection in that sense. Going forward, it is something we need to sort out, Harry. And I don't think away from home we could go and play Lacazette and Aubameyang because I think we'd be too exposed. I just think they don't offer enough, uh, especially going back as well as like someone like an Iwobi would if you tweak the system to not fit the two. So I think we need to work on that. But as a system, collectively, I thought we defended well yesterday. I think when we play like that, it's kind of designed for us to sit and soak pressure a little bit and try and play on the counter-attack almost as if we're the away side because one criticism I do have of that system I always find that we have plenty of the ball amongst the back three the back three will play it from left to right and back again but that transition that pass into the midfield is sometimes more difficult to find when the wing backs push right up and then you've only got that those two players in the middle of the park. I think what surprised me uh, against Manchester United was how disciplined Aaron Ramsey was. And we know Aaron Ramsey's going to work hard. We know he's going to give you 100% effort, but he really sat and helped Granit Xhaka. And that was probably my biggest fear when I looked at that team. I thought, like you said, Ozil, Ramsey, are we going to be solid enough defensively? But to his credit, you know, Aaron Ramsey sat there alongside Granit Xhaka and made sure... um, that he'd done his job. What did you make of Granit Xhaka's performance? He's received a lot of praise. Obviously, he scored that goal, which we'll come on to in a minute. But what did you make of his overall performance? It pains me, Harry, because I was such a big critic of his. (laughs) It pains me because I was so harsh on him. And at the time, I think I was probably right to, but he's proved me and a lot of people wrong. I think the maturity that he's shown of late has been sensational to kind of come from a player who was being bashed left right and center to this kind of more mature um he's just got a more rational head on his shoulders like the the Xhaka of old would dive in he'd make stupid decisions he still gives a pass away here and there but yesterday I thought what he did so well was just control things and actually he's um his awareness has got much better than it was. He gets the ball and he releases it quicker. I think that's something that Emery's coached him to do and maybe something that was coached out of him or should have been by by Wenger. But yeah, I think he's just, he's got so much better. I mean, there's there's not much more you can say than that. He showed great awareness, didn't he, with that incident, I think where the ball came across the penalty area. And I think it was Marcus Rashford running onto it and Granit Xhaka just slid in there yeah, and, and there got you a go. really crucial There you go. Touch. And that, that, that is crucial because that would have been for sure a, a goal. I mean, the, the, the area that he was in and to dive in and be so brave, he came off quite bad in that tackle, didn't he? Yeah. As well. But um, just the timing of that just shows how much he has improved. And, you know, I think he was very highly lauded when, when he came. I don't think Wenger got the best out of him. I think he is a player that needs to be reined in. You've got to say to him, look, like you can't go diving into every single tackle. You can't be trying Hollywood passes. Keep your game simple. And when he keeps it simple, he keeps us ticking. And uh, yeah, I thought him and Ramsey were excellent yesterday. Yeah, and, and as you said already, Ramsey kind of proved that that was wrong about him being able to play as one of the, yeah. the pivot, didn't he? Um, while we're on the subject of Granit Xhaka, though, let's talk about the opening goal. Um, it was a shot from long range. When I saw him shaping up to hit it, I thought, what are you doing? And then it hit the back of the net. Now, there's been a lot of debate about this. A lot of people are are praising Granit Xhaka, and rightly so for his performance. But people are talking about this unbelievable Roberto Carlos-style technique that that he put on that shot. I've watched it back again and again and again, and it just looks to me as though David De Gea has just completely misjudged that. I mean, where do you stand on it? Is there... And a wicked spin on that ball. I thought there was some spin, but not enough to completely wrong foot a goalkeeper. So for me, David De Gea is at fault there. 
I think it's a combination of two. I probably think it was his technique because we have seen them. We have seen him hit them like that. So it's not like it's not in his locker. Um, it's a combination of that and also the wind as well. It was extremely windy at, at the Emirates yesterday, and I think that did play a part. Uh, I've spoken to um, former Brentford and Watford keeper Richard Lee, um, who I work with on a daily basis, and he said to me that um, with the way that he hit it. And the direction that it seems to be going when the ball's in the air, uh, De Gea has chosen the position that he wants to be in. He thinks it's coming that way. And that swerve, that wind, whatever it is, takes it away from him. So you'd be superhuman to be able to change your foot in and get there. So I do kind of feel bad for De Gea. I don't think it's necessarily, you know all his fault I think a partly part of blame can be there just for the fact that he did misread it and he didn't react quick enough but um, it, it was a wicked strike I don't think it's a Roberto Carlos by yeah. any stretch of the imagination <laughs> I mean that's a bit disrespectful to him but um, Xhaka has got that he, he's, he's got that in his game so I won't be too harsh on him yeah no fair enough fair enough I personally feel that the goalkeeper was to blame there and I feel that if Granit Xhaka had that shot 100 times against David De Gea he'd save it 99 of those times I think I don't think there's an excuse for a goalkeeper getting beaten in the middle of his goal from that distance I think yeah. he's got plenty of time to see that and I just think that he's it's a lapse in concentration from David De Gea he's assumed that Granit Xhaka is going to go for that that near post as it were on that occasion and he's kind of stepped there and then he's gone oh shit Actually, yeah. that's not where he's getting. And he's, he's by then he's, he's too committed and it's he's too late. Too yeah, late. Um, uh, yeah that, it's a difficult one. Look, at the end of the day, we don't give a shit, do we? Arsenal. <laughs> no, we don't. Arsenal care, took no. the lead, and and that was that was crucial in the game, particularly after United had the chances that they did. Um, Ainsley Maitland-Niles came in at right wing back, uh, as we've already said. Ainsley Maitland-Niles for me. Um, has kind of stuttered a little bit this season. He, he looked really promising last season when he was coming in and out of the team. This season, he's not been as good, I don't think. Uh, and, and at Wren uh, on the Thursday night before, I couldn't get my head around why Unai Emery didn't bring him on when we went down to 10 men and, and replaced Mkhitaryan because Mkhitaryan played the entire second half at right back. And that, for me, made no sense. Was Unai saving him for this one? Did Unai already have this in his mind that Ainsley Maitland-Niles was going to start against Manchester United? And is that the reason that he, he didn't bring him on and he wanted to keep things fresh? Yeah, I think so. I think so. We've got such a big problem there, Harry, with um, all of our pretty much first choice uh, defenders out. You know, Lichstein is out. Hector Bellerin's out. So it really is scrapping now. And I think he would have had that in mind. He would have known exactly how he wanted to set up against Manchester United based on the, the FA Cup game where we kind of got it wrong um, and we lost that. But um, yeah, I think Maitland-Niles was fantastic yesterday. Absolutely fantastic. Um, I, in, the, in the first half, actually, I was watching it and I was saying to the guys at work, he's struggling here a bit because I, th I think he did. He It took a while for him to get up to the tempo. But as soon as he did... Um, Going forward, he, he was fantastic. He was whipping good balls in. He was linking really well with, with Lacazette, who was the star for me yesterday. Uh, brought everything together. But just back on Maitland-Niles defensively as well, how many times did you go and see him fly into a tackle and win the ball? And that's not something I'm used to seeing from him. And if he can kind of keep a consistency up, he's a, he's a really good option um, when Bellerin's out, I reckon. Yeah, I agree with most of that. I think, for me, Ainsley Maitland-Niles started the game... Uh, a little too casually. Um, I thought there was times where he wanted to play and it wasn't the time. It wasn't the place. And we know that Unai Emery encourages playing out from the back, but there was a, a couple of occasions in that first half where he received the ball right on the touchline. United had pressed him, closed him into a little space. And it was as though I felt that he was a little bit casual there and a little bit too overconfident. Yeah, don't forget, Harry, he's not been in the team already, is he? He's, yeah, he's, that's right. he's been in and out. He's not already had a chance to fully gel with all of his teammates. You know, he's kind of almost third choice in, in that position. Um, it's just a shame that he can't play more in the position that I think he wants to play, which is, is more of a more of a central midfielder. Obviously, he's not going to get that chance um, now, but earlier in the early stages, in the group stages of the, of the Europa League, I think he did play a couple of games there, didn't he? Maybe one or two, I think right at the beginning. But if he would have got more of a chance, I think we could see more of what he can do because I don't think his strengths lie with his defensive play. I think it's more his attacking play. I think he's a very creative 
good player, a good passer, very, very composed on the ball for, for a young lad. And I think there's a bright, bright future ahead for him. Yeah, absolutely. I think Ainsley Maitland-Niles has got a fantastic future ahead of him and long may it continue. Uh, he, he's impressive form now. Bernd Leno had another outstanding game. It's the second one in a row now. Uh, brilliant at Wembley against Spurs. Pulled off a, what I would call a world-class save at the feet of Romelu Lukaku um, when he sort of went to go around him. I thought that was brilliant. To recover from being put on your ass as a goalkeeper is, is brilliant. Um, we actually put a poll out after the United game on the Chronicles of Aguna Twitter. If you don't already follow us, head over there. It's at Chronicles underscore AFC. Uh, asking you guys for your man of the match. Uh, this is how the vote went. Uh, Bernd Leno was the overwhelming favourite and the overwhelming winner with 52%. Granit Xhaka in second place with 29%. Ramsey, 11%. Uh, and then somebody else, 8%. And all the comments under somebody else were Ainsley made and Niles. So no mention for Lacazette. Are you surprised at that? Yeah, I'll say Lacazette. I thought... Just because of how good he's his link up play was, Harry. Every time the ball came into him, it stuck to him like glue. I remember there was one stage was a ball played over the top. The guys controlled it with his head and brought it down and shrugged off about three players. Also, as well on the uh, on the other side in the second half, there was a moment when he came in from the left touch line, beat about four players and dribbled through them. I just think he's such an underrated player, and what he adds to our team is similar, actually but more to what, what Giroud did for us. He's hold-up play. Even though he's a little guy, he's strength. And like when he backs into players, it's just it brings so many players into play. And that's why I think that system with Lacazette and Aubameyang can work. Because what you saw was Lacazette dropping off, um, picking up the ball, or even flicking it onto to Aubameyang, who was just ahead of him. And in that sense, he almost plays like a second striker. And I feel like, actually, this might be somewhat controversial, but if I had to pick one... I would probably pick Lacazette at the moment over Aubameyang, to be yeah, honest. I'd agree with that. I think he gives more to the team overall. I think what Aubameyang and Lacazette did really well yesterday as a pair, and I think this was intentional on Unai Emery's part, was that they were very key in, in occupying those areas between the fullbacks and the centre-backs of Manchester United. And the idea was to prevent Young and Shaw coming forward constantly, and I think that really worked. Having to... Up top, you know, you could say it was a little bit gung-ho, a little bit irresponsible from a defensive standpoint. But what it did was nullify United's fullbacks from coming forward. And I think that overload of their fullbacks was something we had a problem with uh, quite heavily in the FA Cup game that we played earlier on in the season at the Emirates. So I think Unai Emery got that right. I think he was spot on there. Um, going back to Alex Lacazette. He went over in the box and won us a penalty. And, and that penalty ultimately decided the game. Um it basically put United to bed. Lots of debate around this decision. Uh, where do you stand on this one? Taking my Arsenal hat off, Harry, which I have to do. It's not a penalty for me. It's, it's too soft. It's way too soft. There's a slight nudge um, for, from Fred in the back, but it's nowhere near enough to send someone over. I mean, Fred's not very clever because at the, the angle the referee can see, he's gone into him. Lacazette's gone over. You can't really see the extent as to what, how much he's actually put into him but for me nice soft and we talk about referees John Moss yesterday was atrocious I think so many decisions he got wrong and even just letting the game flow he didn't do every single decision I feel like referees in um, in England they have to feel like there's an ego trip like I was watching um, City against against uh, against Watford was yeah. it on Saturday uh, evening right and um the linesman's flagged and Sterling's clearly offside, quite clearly. And the referee runs over, he gets his decision and says, no, I'm, I'm reversing it. Excuse me, but how can the referee be in a position to say that? He's miles behind, the liner can see it, he knows exactly what's happened, even though Jan Mats touched it, it doesn't make any difference, he's still offside. And it, I don't know what it is, like, what's this ego thing with, with the English refs? Every yeah. time. No, you're absolutely right, you're spot on. It, going back to that game as an example... That yes, Yamats kicked the ball against Sterling, but if the ball's ultimately come off Sterling and gone in the back of the net, how can he not be interfering with play? The linesman's clearly told the referee that he was offside, so why have you gone against him? I completely get where you're coming from. Going back to the Arsenal penalty, I didn't think it was a penalty at the time. I've come home and watched it. I still don't think it's a penalty, but I can see why John Moss has bought that. 
because he's looking at it from behind. There is a tangle of some sort. There's contact. Lacazette's been very clever. He's gone down. Um, and I, to be honest, you know, I don't normally praise players for doing things like that. But Lacazette's been very smart there. And after the decisions that went against us last week, I'm not at all uh, bothered about that. You know, it, what goes around comes around, I guess you could say. The, the frustrating thing for me with this whole referee thing is that it, it's not just the one decision in a game, the penalty or the freak. It's the constant incompetence from minute one to minute 90. And there was one incident yesterday in particular, and it was in the first half because I remember um, yeah, I was obviously in the North Bank and Luke Shaw came forward. And I can't remember who it was that came across. One of our players came across and made a challenge on him. It was a foul. There's no doubt about that. It was a foul. But John Moss gestures with his arms as if to say, no way. Let's the play continue for about three seconds and then blows his whistle and pulls it back. And it's like, what are you doing? You've just waved your arms emphatically as if to say, you know, when they sort of cross their arms to say, no, it's not, there's not anything there. So why have you done that? And then two seconds later, reversed your decision. Like it, it just goes to show that how reactionary and how incompetent they all are at the moment. And the Premier League's got a real, real issue with that. Um, let's finish off on the Arsenal game though. And we'll, we'll come back to that. It's, it's a bit of a wider debate. Um, we got the penalty anyway. Aubameyang stepped up to take it. What did you think when Aubameyang picked up the ball? Oh, I was like, oh no. Because initially he started with that run up again, didn't he? And actually uh, it, it was flagged up on match of the day too. He's technique. So uh, Aubameyang doesn't actually look at the ball at any stage. He keeps his eyes fixated on the keeper to see where he goes. And that actually limits your technique a little bit. Because if you're fully focused on the keeper, you're not looking at where you're kicking it or where you where you want to go. Luckily, you know, it, it went in. But if De, De Gea afterwards was going mental, because he was like to himself, if I literally just stood still, it, um, I, I would have saved it. But, you know, props to, to Aubameyang. He, he stuck to his guns. You know, he could have given it. Uh, elsewhere he, he could have given it to, to Lacazette um, but he, he didn't and I was really happy for him because what a player he's been for us I mean I think I saw a stat yesterday uh, since joining he's um, he's he scored the most the most goals just behind Salah in terms of uh, in, in the time he's been there and he just keeps scoring goals. He's not necessarily in the game all the time as well. And that's why I say that Lacazette, I think, does more. Because Aubameyang can be on the periphery, but come up with that important goal. And when you gave it to him yesterday, I mean, you, you sort of knew he was going to score again, didn't you? He wasn't going to miss two in a row. Do you know what? I, I wasn't totally convinced at the time. I say that now, but I was in the stands. And obviously, the, the referee pointed to the spot and the whole stadium erupted. Literally, everybody was jumping up and down with joy. And, and there's a guy that sits sits behind me, really good, Good guy. Uh, but every time Arsenal score, he, he gets a bit, you know, he jumps on you, he shakes you, whatever. Lovely, lovely guy. Um, and th like the penalty got awarded and a couple of people sort of jumped on me and it was shaking me sort of thing to celebrate. And I turned around and I was like, no. And they were like, what, what's wrong with you? I was like, no, he's got to fucking score it first. And when he scores it, then I will go mad. But let him <laughs> score it first. And then I saw Lacazette giving Aubameyang a little pep talk. And I thought, oh, my God, here we go. Yeah. But like you said, the technique is very specific with Aubameyang, isn't it? He looks straight at the keeper. He doesn't want to give anything away. Mm. Um, I think putting a penalty down the middle is sometimes a sign of a lack of confidence. Because I don't think Aubameyang would have put that down the middle had he been full of confidence. Yeah. I think he would have tried to put it away in either corner. But I think after what happened at Spurs, he was reluctant to try anything spectacular. And he thought, you know, let's just hit it down the middle. It's probably the safest option. And like you said, yeah, De Gea will be disappointed. I think all goalkeepers are disappointed when someone puts it down the middle because they just think, if I'd stayed. Yeah, it's not, a, it's not a foolproof technique though, is it, Harry? Because if the keeper does really delay until the last second to, to make a decision about where they're going to go. You can get caught out. Yeah. And I, I think that that's what happened with, um, with Lloris. He, he kind of waited so long. Um, and then Aubameyang, he got up to the ball and he still didn't know where he kind of wanted to put it because Lloris hadn't made it clear. And then and it was it's a half-hearted attempt. Yeah, it's attempt, a half-hearted attempt, yeah. which is why it got saved. But yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm happy for him. He's been, you know, one of our best players this season. So good on him for scoring. Yeah. I mean, based based on obviously the fact that we we picked up the result, um, just going back to some of our listeners uh, who voted in a poll in the lead up to this game, I asked how how you guys were feeling ahead of of this game. Sixty eight percent of Arsenal fans that voted, and there was over two three hundred, I think, uh, went with sixty 
uh, went with a win, sorry, 68%. That's massive, isn't it? That is yeah. massive confidence. And I think that's reflective of our home form this season, is it not? Yeah, it is, yeah. And I think, as, as I said, a lot of fans uh, who watch Arsenal every single game, you know, go to all the games, they would see that we are comfortable at home. I think away from home, it's a completely different thing. And I wanted to ask you, Harry, actually, because, you know, our home form is so good and Emery can get it so right. Why just why can't we replicate that away from home? Because you look at some of the big defeats away, right? Anfield, we went there, we got spanked because we were way too open. How does Emery fix that going forward? We've not got any more games against the top six in the Premier League this season. So it has to be something he works on um, in the summer. But what, what do you think that's down to? I wanted to get your thoughts. I'm not entirely sure, to be honest. Um, I think it's kind of maybe a confidence thing. I, I kind of I looked at the table earlier, and you, you know when you go on PremierLeague.com, you can split the table to show just the away the away record. And I wanted to do that because we were having a debate on the same old Arsenal podcast about this this very thing. And I looked it up, and I found that Arsenal had won five away, lost five away, and I think it was drawn four um, with a ninth best team away from home in the Premier League this season. The likes of Watford have picked up more points at home than us this season. Uh, uh, sorry, away from home, I should say. And I, I I, don't know, is it a bit of a hangover from last season because our away form was so bad? Have Has Unai Emery perhaps been a little bit negative in some of these away games? I think he might have been at times. I think there's been times where we've played sides that had we gone out there and, and given it everything and gone at them from the beginning, they would have crumbled and we probably would have come away with more. But I felt as though we've been a little bit conservative at times and we've allowed teams to grow in confidence. And as a result of that, we've ended up not getting the result. Yeah, there was that stat, what, about 20... To 25 games into the season where we, we hadn't won at a first half yeah. and ultimately that gives teams confidence doesn't it and we did improve in the second half but you're right against the smaller teams definitely we could have gone for it more against the bigger teams I don't know I think it is a mentality thing because there's a hangover from Wenger where we just used to get battered in, in, in big away games if we're completely honest um how we can change that I don't I'm, I'm not sure to be honest I'm not sure I just hope that he can set up that mentality of a winning side again and um, get the tactics right. I think although the most successful teams th this season have been ones that have been consistent in their selection, if you look at Liverpool in the first half of the season, they hardly conceded any goals. They were fantastic home and away because they kept the same back four. And the fact that we've been changing the system and the personnel so much, that that, that doesn't help, does it, at all? No, absolutely not. And I, and. That's one of the things I've criticised Unai Emery for this season. I've taken a lot of stick for it myself, but I felt that at times there was unnecessary changes made. I get that you need to rotate. I get that the modern game is very demanding. I get that you've got a squad that you need to keep happy. Um, but I feel like at times throughout the season, our form has stuttered because of that lack of continuity, that lack of understanding what it is that the manager wants. One week we're playing a 4-3-3, the next week we're playing a 4-2-3-1, and the week after that we're playing a 3-5-2. So there's just lots of uh, things that, you know, you could look back on. But ultimately, Unai Emery, in these past two games, the two games that matter, he's got it right, hasn't he? And, and you know, despite the criticism I've labelled on him and thrown at him earlier on in the season. He deserves praise for that. He got it right at Spurs, in my opinion, but for a bad decision, we'd have won that. He beat Manchester United. Yes, we were a little bit fortunate along the way, but the results are there. So, you know, given all, the, the, uh, sorry, given all of that, taking all of that into consideration, what are our chances like of finishing in the top four now? How do you see it? Oh, it's going to be tough because everyone's saying, you know, we've got the easiest run in and United have got really tough games. Spurs have got really tough games and Chelsea have got some tough games, not as much as, as the other two. I don't know, Harry, because as you're saying, away from home, I think we've got the majority of our games away, don't we? I think we've got five away games and three home games left. And some of them teams could be banana skins because we we got some tough away games to go. I think Watford, we've we got to play who are a tough, are a tough side. That's not going to be easy. And I think people are kind of looking just because they're out the, outside the top six. It's going to be easy. It's not. We got Wolves as well, who are actually the, the big giant killers th this season. And it's not going to be easy. And I think we have to take every game as it comes and not look at other teams and who they're playing. 
yeah, Spurs might have some tough games. They might have to play City away, but, you know, you never know what's going to happen. The only thing that might play into our favour are those middle tiered sides like Wolves, like Watford, who don't necessarily have loads to play Nothing for. to play for, yeah. The, the relegation battlers, as we know, they can always throw up a surprise. So I think, you know, forget about that. Forget about where they are on the table. Just take every game as it comes. Emery's got to get his tactics spot on. And I think we've got a pretty good chance, to be honest. Yeah, absolutely. I've got to say a shout out to my friend Kiri, actually, who me and him have been exchanging on WhatsApp and working out what we think each of the teams in contention for the top four are going to end up with in terms of points. And we kind of worked out, uh, we kind of agreed that Arsenal need to finish on 78 points to get in the top four, to be guaranteed. Um, We had the United game down as a draw in our predictions and we actually allowed for a defeat at Wolves, but we'd need to win the others. So, Looking at our remaining fixtures, we've got United at home, Wolves away, Newcastle at home, Everton away, Watford away, Palace at home, Leicester away, Brighton at home, Burnley away. Now, Burnley could be in the relegation fight by the time we play them. Uh, As you said, Wolves are a very dangerous side. Nobody really wants to go to Molyneux at the moment. Um, You know, Everton away, I know they've not been great this season, but that's never an easy game. Watford away, they've been on good form this season. So there is a few potential banana skins in there. And my concern comes from the fact that we've not been very good away from home and we've got more away games than home games. It's nothing more than that. Um, And we were speaking on the same old Arsenal earlier on this evening and one of the points raised was, are we worried about the away games because we've got that Arsene Wenger mentality that we've got hangover from Arsene Wenger's regime? Well, I don't think that's the case because when you look at it this season in terms of our away form, we're a mid-table side if you just look at the away fixtures. So I think people are right to be concerned about the fact that we've got so many away games and so many away games against sides that on their day are capable of hurting us. So, you know, it's a long way to go. It's going it's to be tricky. If I had to assess our chances, I'd say we're probably sort of we've got a 60% chance now I'd say we're just over halfway maybe uh, in terms of the probability of us actually doing it so uh, I don't know how you rank it if you put a number on it yeah I'd say that's probably about fair 60 you know maybe even lower but maybe about 50% I reckon because it is one of them ones where you can't really look at the fixtures too much I mean you know as you said you predict how many points we'll need it's so difficult Harry because different teams are going to be having different approaches and in the Premier League it's never an easy game like you can't really quantify it like that so I think we need to just go for it but overall you know some people are saying that they want to almost forsake the, the Europa League to focus on the Premier League I think that's really stupid because I think we'll obviously talk about it later but there's a good chance we can still go through against Ren, and that is ultimately an easier way uh, of of getting through just because it's it's a knockout and anything can happen you know with these eight games left in the Premier League there's so many variables you, you never know what's going to happen Spurs might pick up their form and win the rest of their games you know Chelsea might and United might so you can't rely on other teams yeah there's a long way to go there'll be many twists and turns I'm sure um, let's move on to that Ren game which is coming up on Thursday night we'll be releasing our next podcast on Friday uh, morning where we'll be reacting to that game uh, it was a dire performance out in France uh, I think the red card killed us I've already spoken about that on the previous show uh, but how do you assess our chances going into this second leg I'm, I'm fairly confident that we've got what it takes and we've got enough firepower to, to hurt Ren, and if we can get an early goal in particular, then you've got to fancy our chances. Yeah, I mean, I'm not negative about it, especially as you said, with how we've been playing at home. I think there's a there's a good chance. I think a lot of people did underestimate Ren. You know, although they are tenth in the in the table, there's a reason why because they sacked their manager and they've had a complete turnaround. They've got some very exciting, dangerous players who punished us really when we went to play. Um, I think it's going to be difficult. It, it won't be easy. The only thing with us, Harry, is that we can't rely on our defence. And ultimately, if we want to win, we got to win 2-0 or we've got to score three. And that's not going to be easy, is it? That's not going to be easy at all. No, it won't. And we're without Socrates now as well, which is something that we could have done without. Um, I personally thought he was stupid to get himself sent off the other night. I thought after he made that first challenge... Uh, it was a booking. You go to ground, you don't get the ball. You, particularly in Europe, the referee's going to get the card out. Um, I thought he was stupid to get sent off the way he did. At the time, I was really angry with him. I felt that it was going to cost us, and, and it did cost us because I don't necessarily... It's hard because 
you don't want to blame Unai Emery for a player's individual actions and getting himself sent off. But I kind of had a bee in my bonnet with Unai Emery because I didn't feel that he managed the game correctly after that red card happened. I felt, like I said earlier on, that Maitland-Niles should have come on. Maybe Mesut Ozil should have been sacrificed. And Arsenal, having already scored an away goal, should have been more conservative I felt that we were a bit stupid, we were a bit naive, and then at 2-1 down, you know, you take that, that's a decent result. But then Monreal's taking a throw on, almost in that's line with ridiculous. the corner flag. That's ridiculous, but that is sort of, I mean, how are we the only team that actually goes down to 10 men and becomes worse defensively? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, you think you actually, like, get a, get a man down, and then you batten down the hatches, but we can't seem to do that. We've never seemed to do that for a long, long time. And I think that's just, again, our mentality in a big away game on a European night. Arsenal were the team to say, you know what, go on, Ren, have your European night against Arsenal, like, do it again to start, you know, have your way. And um, we just kind of laid down. I think Emery, some of Emery's decisions were very questionable. Like the fact taking off a striker as your only outlet invites pressure. You need someone. You need to, you need you need someone to be there. I think it would he play Ramsey's like a false nine almost. Yeah, he did. And, and it was like, if you're going to do that, if you're going to bring Ramsey on and take off your striker and, and he brought Kolasinac on as well, didn't he? Towards the end of the game, you're thinking, right. Tighten it up then. If, if you're bringing these guys on for a forward, you'd think they'd go and sit in the midfield and defend, but they didn't. They were almost chasing shadows like centre forwards. And for me, that made absolutely no sense. And Emery's management of that game drove me absolutely mad. And I've said that on the last podcast that I'm not going to keep sort of beating the same drum, but I thought it was poor. Um, but I think you made a really interesting point when you said that people underrated Wren. I think that's absolutely 100% the case. On last week's show, we had Jeremy Aliadier uh, join us, who was a good friend, or is still a good friend of, of the former Wren manager, Lamucci. And he said on the show that he, you know, he knows Lamucci very well. He knows that they have a very talented squad of individuals, people like Saar uh, Bourgeon, I think his name was, the guy that scored the first goal. Uh, he was full of praise for Ren and said that they were a very underrated side with good individuals, Hatton Ben Arthur being another one, that on their day could cause you problems. And I felt like Arsenal were a little bit naive, maybe a little bit complacent. Um, particularly the fans were anyway. We will never know what goes on in the dressing room. But from a fan's perspective... It was almost as though it was a foregone conclusion that we were going to go to France and win. And I think as a result, you know, people were shocked by by how it went. Now, looking ahead to Thursday, give us a prediction before we move on to a slightly wider debate. <sighs> That's a tough one. You put me on the spot here. The fence. Get off the fence. Oh, <laughs> uh, I don't know. You know what? I'm going to say it's going to be another free one. We'll take it to extra time and we'll beat them. We'll beat them on penalties. I'm going to say that. I'm, I'm, I'm going to go for it because I think we will concede, but I think we've got more than enough to score two or three. I th it's going to be tight, but yeah, if you have to push me, I'll say 3-1 win on penalties. I'm going to go for a 4-1 Arsenal win. That's what I'm going with. That's what I'm going with. I'm on good form in my predictions lately. Hopefully we can keep it up. I'm Martin Tyler, and you're listening to Harry Simeon. Now, I know this is an Arsenal podcast, but there have been some huge talking points uh, coming out of the world of football, particularly uh, English football these last few days, and one of them being pitch invaders. Uh, we've seen a couple of incidents this weekend. We saw two on Sunday, uh, one at St. Andrews, which was more severe, uh, where a, a Birmingham City fan managed to get himself onto the field of play and appeared to punch Jack Grealish in the back of the head. Um, that's not on, uh, not in any way, uh, saying that that's acceptable. There's no place for that in football. Uh, and then we saw another pitch invader later on at the Emirates Stadium who kind of barged into Chris Smalling. Uh, fortunately, on that occasion, no one was hurt. But how do you deal with a problem like pitch invaders? It's impossible, isn't it, to cover every single angle and every single part of the pitch with a steward to prevent this happening. How would you tackle this? Uh, I think more so, Harry, the, the problem lies with the, the mentality of fans now. I think social media has been such a good thing, but also such a bad thing of rallying people together and the scum ultimately come together. And it's coming from like a, a younger, younger uh, the guy who uh, attacks Drew Grealish was 27. He's, he's not old. He's part of the social media generation. And, it's just a, a thing where obviously fans have a, a drink, that they have a laugh, and then they get rowdy, and 
running onto the pitch. I mean, we haven't seen that in like years and years in this country. It's mental. In terms of the stewards, I feel sorry for them because they're on a minimum wage of seven pounds, eight pounds an hour. If, if that was me, I'm, I'm not going to want to go and like tackle a, a big fan who's just been, you know, drinking loads and he's off his head with whatever and who's violent. I'm not going to want to do that. And especially because they're not trained either. They're just like regular people. Some are women as well. Like if that was my wife, if that was my family member, I would not feel comfortable with her being there knowing that there are people like that wanting to cause harm. It's just, I don't know. I think you have to, clubs have so much money these days, spend a bit more money on, on stewards, get some people who are actually trained who are willing. If someone comes on a pitch or if they even get out, if you see them running towards the front of the stand, tackle them down. Yeah. And you, you need trained people to do that. I mean, Vinnie Jones was on TalkSport, I think, uh, earlier on today. And he was talking about the fact that he had more security at his wedding than you get <laughs> at a Premier League football match these days. And that's out, uh, that's astounding. But I think you hit the nail on the head there when you talk about them not being trained. I think football clubs have so many stewards on a match day. But let's take the Emirates, for example, a stadium we know very well. Uh, I can't even tell you how many stewards there are there. There's loads. Most of them are students or people doing it part time to make a little bit of extra pocket money. And so they're not trained. They're not professionals. And that's no disrespect to them. But they're not security personnel. They are stewards who are there to oversee, uh, you know, an event. My opinion on it is that maybe it's time that Premier League clubs spent a bit of money to have a percentage of their steward population being fully trained and being security personnel. Maybe the people around the edge of the pitch should all be professional security guards. So that in the instance when a fan does get on the pitch they're ready to go on there and deal with it in the way it should be dealt with. Not having six, seven stewards chasing someone and that they can't get him and they don't know how to take him down and they can't handle him. You know, two big geezers, two big security guards to be there and ready and waiting. And when that happens, they go and deal with it in the way that it should be dealt with. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're completely right. And I'll, I'll make the point, I don't want to by any means, you know, be satirical or, or have a laugh, but a few a few weeks ago, there was an incident where a cat got on the pitch at Goodison Park. Oh, stewards couldn't even get them. <laughs> <laughs> How are they going to get a hooligan? Yeah, Do you know true. what I mean? Like it's just ridiculous, and it also comes from the clubs. And I think uh, the FA now needs to have a strong, strong reaction to this this um, Jack Grealish incident. Obviously, the guy has been dealt with by the police. I think he's got um, a, a short prison sentence. Good, you know, take that. He deserve, fully deserves it. But the FA now needs to honed down and really going hard. I think personally, Birmingham should have a full stadium ban. I think they should be forced to play behind closed doors. There's a lot of people have been saying, I fully agree with that. Um, I think if any, if this does happen in, in future, I think they need to be, they need to be instantly, instantly ejected. Their season ticket needs to be scratched up and, there's there, there's no there's no light punishment on this because what you have to say to all fans is that if you do this you're in big trouble and I think now if they do that maybe people will start to actually make you know they'll second guess it next time. Is there a danger though that if you start punishing the club as severely as as what you're saying stadium bans points deductions things like that that you end up encouraging a culture whereby fans are policing each other. And then you could have violence breaking out in sections of the stadium. And so is there not a danger that if you go too hard, you're kind of giving the f fans more to be angry about? Say, for example, Birmingham City. Put you, let's look at that as an example. If Birmingham City were to be deducted points and as a result find themselves in a relegation battle because of it, would you not see f certain fans then sort of when they're seeing this behavior and they understand now what is at stake, they'll try and maybe self-police and end up going and getting into confrontations with these hooligans. Does that not cause more problems? Yeah, I know what you mean, Harry, but I think it's such a small percentage of them, um, of the fans that will actually condone that. I think most sensible people, even like some of the hooligans, they would have been like, that's too far. They would, they would have seen their mate and be like, what on earth are you doing? And no, I don't think so. I can't think that there can be a light reaction to this. And um, I think the majority of fans, especially Birmingham, will understand it and say, you know what? That guy's made a massive mistake. Yes, it wasn't me that, that was directly involved, but I understand. I mean, 
it's got so bad to the point where do you see that on Twitter um, there was this guy who got banned because he he posted a picture of Jack Grealish's brother's grave or something. Yeah, that's, and that's said disgusting. Like what, what? It's more of a wider point about how do people feel like that's acceptable? And this is what social media does. It allows people to pipe up. I'm sure this guy. Um, who, uh, who who attacked Grealish was probably loving the fact that this footage would have been shown everywhere. Yeah. His mates would have seen that. It would have been shared on social media. He probably thought he was going to become like a bit of a star. Is that because people are not accountable for their social media accounts? They're not held accountable. So I would say that one way of dealing with stupidness like that, like post- posting pictures of graves and saying disgusting things like that would be to force people on social media, and I know this is a whole other debate, so we won't go too far into it, but would be to force people to input ID to sign up to Twitter. Then the authorities would know exactly who you are, and and if you do stuff like that, you'll be caught, you'll be shut down, and you'll be punished accordingly. Yeah, because what actually happened is um, someone in, uh, in, in the replies found his address they, they they put his full address. That they put his um the full name, and so people can find it. Like if you put your, if you have your full name on Twitter, this guy's an idiot, by the way, an absolute idiot. If you're gonna do that, at least be anonymous, yeah. Because he's welcome that now. And um, I, one of the comments was like, yeah, enjoy the the hundreds of pizzas I've I've just sent to your house. Like have fun paying for that and stuff like that. And his Twitter account's been banned. And yeah, ultimately it is the accountability, and it just gives people confidence that they wouldn't have if they were face to face with someone and that's that's a problem with twitter um because they don't go down hard, hard enough on on things like this and hopefully this incident um will will make them make the law stronger yeah absolutely totally agree and the other point that i wanted to touch on which is not arsenal related it's more of a wider uh, general football point was the var point uh, we've seen it in the champions league now as well um we saw United uh, get a questionable penalty uh, out in Paris and ultimately they went through as a result of it. What have you made of the implementation of VAR, particularly in the Champions League? Oh, in the Champions League, it's been shambolic. I think during the World Cup, I remember the first couple of uh, games in the group stages were also shambolic, but towards the end of it, they kind of got it together. And don't forget, that is the world's top referees from around the world. Europe... Slightly lower standard. England, shocking standard. Let's not even get into that. I'm like shitting myself to see like what what's going to go on next season with VAR. But in terms of the Champions League, I don't think it's been implemented. There's not enough communications between the rule changes and then the fans or even the players. And sometimes even the referees, are, sometimes I don't think, I have no idea what what, what they're doing. Um, I mean, there was an incident recently where... Um, the, the referee couldn't go and check a VAR decision because the screen wasn't working. I mean, like, how yeah, incompetent that's, that's is all this, man? Uh, with, the, with, with, with Kim Pembe, I thought he was unlucky. And a lot of ex-pros that I've spoken to have all said it wasn't a handball because they've played the game. That, that's the difference between um, people who played the game and the players and the referees. They see it as a very black and white incident. And by the letter of the law, you know, it is a penalty. It is a handball because he's made himself bigger by turning around. Um, he was quite far away from, from where Pereira took the shot. Um, it was. In, it looked like it was going towards the target. And um, some people were saying he could have got out of the way. I don't know if I necessarily agree with that, but... The thing is with, with VAR is that the referee didn't see the incident at all. The, the VAR has flagged it up. And I feel like every single time the, the referee has been flagged up, he goes, have a look. The pressure's on him to, to give the penalty now. And I can't see a lot of referees that actually having the balls to say, no, I disagree. Well, there was one, wasn't there, in the World Cup? I think it was in a Brazil game. There was a penalty call and he, uh, I think it was that game anyway, where he was told to go and look at it and he still stuck to his gun. So, it's nice to see referees showing balls, like you said, and doing that. I think for me, one of the big issues is is the rules. Now, at the time those rules were written, there was no VAR. So they were fit for purpose. It was all about interpretation. Is it intentional? Is it not intentional? The minute VARs come in, it's become a game changer because now referees are having the opportunity to see things in slow motion from various angles, a luxury that they didn't have in the past. So what I think needs to happen is the rules now need to be adjusted to be fit for purpose. So to be relevant to the technology that we have now and the way that the game is going to be moving forward, because 
that's the issue for me. You know, at once, uh, in one sense, you know, you're saying that Kimpembe made himself bigger, and that's absolutely right. And UEFA uh, released a statement, didn't they, where they said that they'd been given a directive to look for that. But on the other hand, it does say in the handball rule that for you to award a penalty or a free kick, you have to judge it to be intentional. So it contradicts itself, doesn't it? That's what I'm trying to say when I say the laws need to be adjusted to suit where we are in terms of the modern game now. And I, I think that's there's a lot of work to be done there. Yeah, 100%. And these rules, Harry, they're so open-ended and open to interpretation. I mean, I read the, the new FA rules on the FA website that are coming in, uh, proposedly, um, for, for next season. And it is ridiculous. One of the new things that they're proposing is that players will have a natural, this is their word, natural silhouette of movement. So if, if they come outside of that natural silhouette, then it would be handball. And I'm like, what, what on earth does that mean? Like, if they, you're looking at me now, looking at what is he talking about? Exactly. What the fuck I is know. a natural silhouette exactly. of movement? And um, one of the guys uh, that I was speaking to made the point, well, obviously someone like Akin Fenua is going to have a different natural silhouette to someone like Mark Albrighton. So how yeah. can you... Like, they're not, <laughs> they're not making it easy. They're making it harder for themselves. And with, with the VAR, they're going to flag something up. They're going to have about 15 different rules running through their mind to try and make the decision under pressure and I just feel like next year Harry is going to be a bit of a shit show and it's going to take them a long long time until they can get used to the rules and implement it properly yeah I think we're going to go through a painful transition whilst this is coming in uh, but Conversely, there has been some good from VAR. I remember the first leg of Atletico Juventus in the Champions League this season. Uh, there was two decisions that were key. I think Juventus were awarded, a, or was it Atletico? Someone was awarded a penalty and the referee saw it and he found it was outside the box. And then there was a goal ruled out correctly. So there have been some good, good examples of it too. And I think overall, if they can iron out all the creases it will be a positive thing but it's just going to take some time uh let us know what you guys think as well on var on the jack Grealish incident the issue of pitch invaders and of course arsenal's performance at manchester united uh, not at against manchester united let us know how you think we'll fare against wren in the europa league this coming thursday and uh, we'll be back on friday to review that game Guys, while you're here and while I've got your attention, don't forget you can vote for us in this year's Football Blogging Awards. Your support would be much appreciated. We are in the categories of best podcast and best new content creator. Uh, so do head over there, uh, head over to the voting page. I'll put it in the link in the description below. All you've got to do is go to those two categories, type in the Chronicles of Aguna and hit the vote button. Uh, Mike, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks for coming in again. And uh, I'm sure we'll speak again very soon. Cheers, Harry. Hope you're after on a big win. Yep. Yes, indeed. <laughs>